Hey, welcome to the SBP podcast, Mobile Filmmaking, the voice of mobile film. I'm your host, Susie Botello, and you're listening to episode 80. Whoa, how did we get here? <laughs> Cinematography and choreography. How well do these play together when making a film that evolves around dance? Oh, and by the way, how can a smartphone camera make it easier on a camera person than a full-sized camera? Well, these are part of the discussion that my guest and I dove into in depth in this episode of the SBP podcast. Jamie Lawrence won second place at the International Mobile Film Festival in San Diego last month. His film, Benched, was a dance performance of Isolation, shot in a park in Glasgow. The film was choreographed by mobile filmmaker Jamie Lawrence, a dancer himself. I think you will find a conversation that connects mobile filmmaking to the art of dance and storytelling in film pretty interesting. By the way, we made an announcement regarding the rules for the 2021 International Mobile Film Festival in San Diego. The feature film length was extended from 90 minutes to 120 minutes. That's two full hours. The open call for films begins June 19th. You can go to our website, internationalmobilefilmfestival.com, and get all the details on the rules page from the menu. Hi, everyone. It's Cara Rust from Cape Town, South Africa. I am the director of English Made Simple. I submitted my comedy short to the International Mobile Film Festival this year, and it's just been an incredible experience. Susie is so supportive, and their social media presence is incredible. I would suggest to any mobile filmmaker to submit their film to this festival. It has just been amazing. Welcome to the SBP podcast, Mobile Filmmaking. I am here with the second prize winner of the International Mobile Film Festival in San Diego, Jamie Lawrence, who won second prize for his film shot with the iPhone X, Benched. And uh, we're going to now go straight to Jamie. Jamie, how are you? I'm good. I'm okay. It's uh, early morning for me, night time for you. So separated yeah. by time and space. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of uh, space, where exactly are you right now? So I am at home in Glasgow in uh, Scotland in the UK. Wonderful. Uh, Jamie, before we talk about you, because you have a very interesting and amazing uh, background, and I actually... I'm pretty excited to share what it is that you do because it takes a lot of um, persistence and focus to do what you do. But before I go there, tell everybody a little bit about your film Benched and why you filmed it with the iPhone. Sure. So um, Benched came quite early in my uh, story so far. Um, it was actually the second mobile film that I decided to make and the first mobile film that used more than just a phone and a stabilizer. Um, yeah, the idea behind Benched was to, just like all my films, get my choreography seen. Um, so I needed something that was short form um, that was my choreography on screen, but also wasn't, um, you know, just a, a bit of studio work. Uh, so I wanted to basically try and tell a story as much as I could in the time that I had with the equipment that I had. And what made you want to to make this with a phone? I mean, you started, um, what turned you on to, the, to making movies or anything like that with the iPhone out of all the cameras that you probably had access to, not just the phone, right? Yeah, I mean, I, I would have had access to other cameras if I decided to, for instance, uh, use friends of mine who work with cameras or uh, work with a, 
at that time established professional you know editor um but the thing about what i was doing is i was trying to move forward independently um in order to sort of build my uh, choreographic language my choreographic message and get it out there um i was really actually doing something that's probably seen more in uh, dance and choreography than might be seen in film which was kind of um persistently almost stubbornly sticking with the uh, everything that I could do myself. Um, and if the outcome wasn't, you know, uh, something that I could use, then that would just be that really. So that ability to experiment and, and take a risk like that was uh, something that came from my dancing and my choreography. And, and that's kind of, you know, you said that I, I have access to other cameras, but actually I didn't have access to any other cameras of my own. Um, and uh, my experience with Premiere Pro kind of grew out of my um when I was at, at, at school training, I actually had some experience with music recording. So everything you've seen about my um, film and my work is actually self-taught as a result of um, fulfilling a need um, rather than training in something long term and then afterwards kind of making an output there. And you seem pretty apt at doing things by yourself. Um, and I say that also because uh, for the film festival, you sent in a video salute a, a message <laughs> and, yes, <I> did. <laughs> uh, yeah and it was just uh crazy awesome to be honest with you it was just wonderful um i had asked you to go ahead and be creative and you know just throw what you what you could my way and it was just amazing it was so so cool and creative and you did a lot all by yourself and the and the other yous <laughs> Yeah, so actually that request for that uh, came at the end of a day when I'd been using that idea, actually. So um, during the current situation of the, the lockdown at the moment we have in Scotland during Corona, um, the Royal Conservatoire of Scotland, where I teach regularly, uh, asked me, could I come up with some kind of online uh, either, you know, recorded video or Zoom based task for the uh, dancers um, at their at their college? And <laughs> I'd actually spent the whole day. Uh, making this uh, task where I sort of set a task and actually there were a lot more costumes than the ones you see in that salute but at the time that you'd asked for it I, I had everything set up so I decided to just do another you know hour of getting a few bits together for that and um, so yeah for those for those people out there that already know me and have seen that other task and um, they'll recognize the many me's um, and I can actually fit quite a few in before my pc starts to uh, hemorrhage and uh, overheat <laughs> <laughs> well, so you you really had that down that whole technique, didn't you? Yeah, and again, it, it grew out of um, experimenting. So I was in the studio uh, choreographing in twenty, I think it was twenty nineteen. Um, something that's completely different, wasn't humorous at all. Um, I was just capturing movement, and I had two clips next to each other in Premiere, and uh, I was like, actually, they're so. Um, they're mirrored so perfectly with the camera in a fixed position. I wonder if there's a way of putting them together. And, and so actually I started in a more complicated way. I started using transparency layers to make it look like they're in the same place when actually all I needed to do was crop them down the middle. And so, yeah, things have kind of got easier to produce those type of things to kind of crop and edge feather those. Uh, but, yeah. but yeah, basically it all comes out of um, dance for me, just like everything that um, has happened for me so far. Wow. So, Share with us a little bit about your dancing and and first of all, I I I have no idea, but I'm imagining that this was something you were interested in since you were a child, right? Yeah. So I my mother was actually a, a dancer herself and performer, um, and she started a school in East London, literally about the time I was born, probably before. So, um, yeah, I was born and, and was immediately with her all the time. Um, and uh, I got to experience dance from a very, very young age. Um, and But I did it alongside my regular studies. So I actually uh, managed to achieve a place at, at quite a prestigious academic school up to the age of, um, you know, 12. And, and, and then at 13, we... <laughs> There, there's some decisions were being made like, you know, you should maybe consider training as a lawyer. What about your future? And at that age, I was like, I have no idea what I want to do. I just know that I don't want to be told you're going to be this. So I, I left the sort of British private school system, uh, you know, that sort of Eton and, and the place I was very similar, that sort of level of education where I was playing 
rugby, football, cricket, every sport you can you can name. We had access to every subject. Like you know, I was being asked to study Latin at, at 12 years old, which was something that. I remember my father was, you know, he was very impressed and and, and telling his uh, family members that I was, you know, studying Latin and doing all this stuff and I'd be going to university. But I had totally different plans. And so at um, at uh, I think it's 12, 13, I I decided to audition and go to a fully uh, full time performing arts school, vocational school here in the UK called uh, at the time it was called the Arts Educational School Tring Park. Um, And it was in a big park in Tring. And I did, uh, again, as, as well as all the dancing, I was doing drama, I was doing music, um, and everything I'd had access to as a child was then taken to that sort of um, semi, semi-professional semi uh, vocational training level. And then while I was there, I achieved a place at uh, the, what was then called the Trinity uh, College of Music. It's now part of Trinity Laban. Um, and people will actually know that without realizing because every single period drama you've ever seen in film has been shot at the Naval College in Greenwich, which is where <laughs> that is. Uh, so I was, yeah, I actually saw film sets and things like this um, between the ages of, you know, uh, 15 and, uh, and 17. And at the time it didn't occur to me that it would be a good time to, you know, start getting some tips and tricks there. Um, so I, I was studying music, I was studying dance, I was doing all of that. And then I decided to focus on classical ballet I had a real um drive to want to be in a classical ballet company and and dance company and and so I did some uh final year training at the Central School of Ballet in London uh which is the only educational institution I went to that's still called the same thing as the time I went there uh because this was quite long ago uh so yeah I, and then uh, from Central School of Ballet I, I managed to get a contract as a, a classical dancer here at the Scottish Ballet and so for the past 10 years, I've been dancing at the Scottish Ballet and um, now as a soloist of the company. Wow, that's an amazing, uh, that's an amazing background. And oh, do you mind if I ask what kind of dance your your mom did? Uh, so my mom, uh, she was trained in, in she actually, she's very diverse um, she, uh, versatile is the right word, actually. She can do ballet. She was um she was teaching ballet, tap, jazz, modern, contemporary dance, um, and anything she couldn't uh, teach herself, she would get in a teacher. So, you know, even her very first school offered drama, offered music. Um, and, and the reason my music training was so strong is actually um, a lady called uh, Moira Hartley. Uh, she built a music department um, alongside my mum's dance school that actually was sending uh, kids to big music colleges like the Royal College of Music and uh, Trinity, like I went to. Um, some like me went to the conservatoire for their sort of Saturday school extra training, um, but some went on to do full time music training there. So, yeah, the, the music training for me, what I use it for now is obviously achieving music rights, selection of music and um, being able to talk to composers in, in their language. Um, so I kind of have that go between uh, tool there. So when you when you um choreographed your film because basically that's what the kind of director that you are when you're you're creating these these films with dancing right you're choreographing right yeah I mean I so I'm gonna say some stuff here that I've never actually really talked about outside of doing it which is with with choreography you know I I always have been creating um you know from a very young age it wasn't even something that I was like considering separate um every now and then one of my teachers might say could you make that over there could you fill this amount of music with that you know in a show things like this so um it started there and then it grew into wanting now after dancing so many um prestigious international choreographers work it, I, I now want to have something to say I want to get my stuff out there um but what I haven't really talked about is is how I capture my work so for those that, that have seen some of my other videos and have kind of said, well, how did he move quickly or how did he, is he on rails? What's going on? Um, a lot of the time I'm sliding, slipping, running, uh, jumping <laughs> with a stabilizer attached to me or in hand. Um, and with wow. my films, I have to choreograph my track through um, a piece, which in Benched is maybe not so evident But in uh, some of my other more recent stuff, you'll see that there's a lot of camera movement going on. And again, getting to the thing I've never really talked about, I actually found the inspiration of how I wanted to see dance through big movies like (laughs) The Avengers and uh, big Marvel films and things like this. The way the action shots are done, 
um, for instance, if you look at uh, Avengers Assemble, the big shot where they all um, assemble for the first time and this big sweeping orbit shot and things like this, these are the kind of visuals that really interest me. Um, and so I've tried to take those and apply them to how I capture dance because I think it can really enhance uh, the choreography itself. And actually, sometimes some of the choreography is then made the other way um, and you think, oh, that will actually look great on camera. And if I do that, I want to see it from this angle. So it's all kind of, you know, um, merging into this one choreographic filmmaking. Yeah, it's like a very thing. interesting blend of cinematography and choreography, which is, um, I mean, it, that's something you master and you have the talent to do because of what you do, right? Yeah, I never really thought about um, the sort of cinematic process and, and looking at a film outside of watching it until I met, um, I don't, I, I can't remember her first name, but at the time, my teacher, Miss Kim, um, she and Miss Haywood, they were two teachers I had at uh, Tring that I'd mentioned, and they uh, took my film studies A-level. So in uh, the UK, we had something called A-levels, and uh, I did uh, four of them. And one because I'd chosen to do so many alongside all the dancing, I needed one that I considered simpler. Um, of course, once I got into film studies, I had two really dedicated, really enthusiastic teachers there, um, and they obviously took me through the basics in the first year. And in the second year, we really looked in depth at uh, how films are made, um, what certain shots are designed to do. I mean, very peripheral when compared to someone that might have gone to film school for, I don't know, um, three to five years, which I know some people do. But but their passion and their drive um, and their such a deep understanding of different films, um, with one being really keen on Ridley Scott films, you know, like mm. looking at Alien, for example, and how those designs, why why those designs were done the way they were. Um, yeah, it was just new for me at the time. Then I forgot about it. And now at this age, you know, nearly a decade later, it all comes flooding back as I start to look at, well, how do I capture that to reflect this or what's going to look good about this? And also in editing, because, you know, I myself, um, I did a lot of editing uh, for different videos and created montages and things like that. And one of the cool things was finding specific shots, you know, with camera pans going this way. But then you you position that in the edit with a camera move going the other way. And it's sort of like the movements of the shots as you're editing are sort of dancing and playing to each other. Yeah, I, so movement is a key word you've used there. And I think that when you have an understanding of movement, which is not, you know, there's no stamp of approval that says your understanding of movement is correct. But like my understanding of movement has grown out of obviously my experience in dance companies mm -hmm. um, and uh, seeing dance in the kind of industry I'm in. And yeah, basically th that idea of movement, I, I often think about um, uh, movement directors, which is something I'm very interested in doing. Um, you often watch, you know, say you watch a, a musical film or, or a film that's got a dance sequence like La La Land, for example. Um, you kind of can see when it's working and you can see when it's not. And some people understand, you know, everyone understands whether they like it or not. But some people obviously understand what is it about that shot and, and that movement that's that's gelling. And a lot of it is to do with the synchronization of the dance, the choreography um and the camera movement. And I think that there's an understanding there that maybe, I don't know if it's undervalued or overvalued, I, who knows, because I'm not an employed movement choreographer yet. However, I, I think that there's a skill there that's kind of developing, um, for me at least, and uh, I'm interested in, you know, pursuing it. Oh, I, I, I can almost promise you that the more and more that you do this, um, you, you may end up in Hollywood with an award in your hand uh, for this because you're you're talking about different things and your experience in all of them. They're all very well connected to to the cinematography and um, your how you envision the the complete artwork that you're creating visually, uh, which is your in your films. Um and as a camera person uh, myself, when my first uh, camera was a big VHS camera <laughs> back when I was a teenager. And uh, 
my my mom is from Spain and she uh, performed a lot in uh, flamenco music and I got to sort of grow up around flamenco uh, dancers and I, uh, you're familiar obviously with flamenco right yeah I actually um part-time lived with a flamenco dancer at one point who was the boyfriend of my flatmate so uh, yeah I, I got really into flamenco at one point it's uh it's a very very expressive form of dancing um, and one of the things that I remember, they, 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 I, my first paid gig was actually capturing them in the studio. It was a man and a woman, a couple uh, that were actually married dancing, and uh, they paid me 50 bucks <laughs> to go and spend a, a few hours with them and capture shots of them dancing. And um, I didn't have a, a video editor or anything like that. So I just captured everything very carefully as, and then gave them the tape. Right. Um, but the one thing that they, that I learned, um, was how to move the camera, uh, what sort of have a sense of when they were going down to their feet to doing their footwork Mm -hmm. and when they would open up and you can tell there's a, there's a connection between the music itself you know, the guitars and, and the clapping and all that, and you see when they're going to open up. And then I would I would sort of go up with the camera from their feet and start to move it slowly up towards their hand and arm movements. And I can see uh, with what you're doing that you would probably get really good with that. And the fact that you're using a mobile phone... Um, which is very light in, you know, in that aspect would give you a lot of freedom to move around in the choreography of your, your filming. Yeah. I think that, um, what you're saying is exactly right and can kind of bring us on to what makes mobile filmmaking, uh, for me particularly, uh, something that is, uh, kind of essential. I'd like, I wouldn't have been able to do what I've done probably with the budget, especially the budget I have, but also, with the equipment and um, the amount I'm moving, it, it's, you know, it's very intense. That's why I need the right um, stabilization and the right uh, equipment. That's actually quite hard wearing. Like you've got to be prepared. <laughs> you've got to be prepared to drop it. And I have um, basically uh, what you've kind of talked about there with the VHS reminds me of, of uh, how I kind of talk about and think about mobile filmmaking, which is um, my background is in live performance. So in a live performance, you know, you you get one chance to say it. Mm -hmm. Everything needs to be as right as it can be. And and that teaches you that perfect is kind of unachievable in that sense. Um, It's not something you even want to be aiming to achieve once you've uh, had that kind of performing experience. And I think that the reason mobile filmmaking works for me is that there is that live element. Um, You know, on on the mobile, even with a great app like Filmic Pro, um, everything is much more automated uh, than a bigger um, uh, video capture camera. So um, you kind of have more work to do in the sense that you got to get it right. You've got to get everything, you know, as, as close to what you're looking for in the shoot as you can, because in edit, although you're not limited and, and what you've got in your pocket is an incredible um, device for the size. And um, obviously with working with mobile, you can have exposure issues or is filmic pro um have you, have you set everything right for the shoot that, you know, the same things you'd have with other, you know, video equipment. But I, I think that you need to be, at least in my experience and speaking to other video editors, you need to get more right um, at the time of the shoot. So I respond well to that live kind of um, element. And that's kind of what's led me to actual, you know, achieving professional engagements with larger companies like the BBC, because they've seen that I don't really uh, crack under that pressure of um, despite having a lower budget in the sense that I'm working with all my own equipment and mobile. And um, I'm still trying to aim for this, you know, high output, high level of output and as pristine as possible um, edited film, which is obviously, you know, a very difficult thing to achieve. And I'd love to work with a Hollywood budget, like you've talked about earlier to see uh, what the outcome would be. Well, definitely, I can tell you that there's a lot of respect and honor in that, in someone who films in that way that doesn't always think, well, I can probably do something with that later in editing, 
you know, or that can be fixed in post or that can be altered and to really shoot in in that way because um, a lot of people underestimate uh, underestimate what they can do in post and how well everything can come together. But if you do your very, very best while you're shooting as if it's a live performance, um, that's the best way to shoot and to always shoot. And it's not about being a perfectionist. It's just about, you know, um, again, with your background and everything like that, like I said earlier, it takes persistence and experience. And the more experience you have, the more comfortable and the more confidence that you have behind the camera and how that's going to turn out. Yeah. And also, you know, it, it kind of it, it's dishonest in a way for me. Um, and, and that's being a purist in the kind of dance sense. Mm-hmm. You know, my, my experience as a dancer, I've actually done a lot of shoots. I've been involved in quite a lot of um, recorded uh, recorded dance. And you never feel like what you did was either your best or you hear them talking about using a take that you didn't like. Um, or once you've had the thing mixed down and cut, it doesn't look like what you did on the day you know and obviously there's situations where that's great especially if you're doing something that's heavily edited but if like me I've got quite a few um long running one shots and um, you want the best take and you also want the the people behind the camera to really be capturing the best elements of it so a lot of the dancers I work with they kind of trust me because it's quite a big deal for them to let someone independently put something out where they're dancing and you know a lot of them volunteer to take part and you know almost none of the dancers in in any of my independent stuff are paid in that way um just simply because of budget and simply because they wouldn't want to be because they're just seeing it as an extension of working with the choreographer mm-hmm. um but uh, having a, having actually said that, looking at these here now, I think everyone since 2018 has received something for the work that they've done. So I take that one back. Everyone is paid. Um, but, you know, obviously in, in you know, you, again, you mentioned Hollywood earlier. The kind of money people earn for even a 10 minute sequence would be, you know, in the region of uh, a thousand times factor of what I can pay for something. So, yeah, the, People wouldn't be dancing my stuff if they didn't want, um, if they didn't trust me to put it out at that level. Um, and I think that, yeah, it would be. I think it would be great to change the way things are done in that communication between the dance and the uh, filmmaking. Because, again, my experience has always kind of been negative as a dancer, whereas I feel like I'm getting some some positive responses from the people I've been working with so far, at least to my face. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it is it it is a trust issue, and I know I always say this, um, and, and these uh, when I talk to people all the time about filmmaking and such, that it's um, you have you know you have the crew members, but also the actors, and they become family uh, because of the trust, you know. And once you find a team, right, that you work well uh, with together. Um, there's a magical connection in that, that you all trust each other. And if you can get four or five people that work well together and trust each other and know that each one is going to play their part as, as best as possible, then everyone, the output from everyone is great. And then the end result is fantastic most of the time, right? Yeah, I mean, you know, I presented this huge value proposition to the BBC, which is why they engaged me a couple of times already, um, because uh, I they seemed quite surprised. As a dancer, it didn't surprise me because I know many dancers that can do so many things when they put their mind to it. It's a, it's a very unique work ethic when you've committed to doing that as full time. Um, whereas the BBC, you know, they were very surprised that I was going to be choreographing um dealing with the set and the layout of the scene um capturing editing directing um what i consider my the best example of my work is a film i made called flight um which can be found you know on my website or can be found on youtube under my name um and with flight i was running up and down the stairs of the uh headquarters of bbc scotland and on that day you know, you said about having a team, whereas my team lives in my backpack, my nomad backpack, which I use to carry all my stuff. And so I arrived, unpacked everything, 
I actually expected that I was going to be receiving a team from the BBC. That didn't materialise. Um, and so I ended up um, doing every aspect of the film, including the edit afterwards as well, which, again, I had I wasn't sure how that was going to be. And they said, well, if you can do it, you do it. So I kind of did it all. Um, and it was such an amazing opportunity and a great way to showcase what I could do that then when I had my I had later interactions with the BBC, they were like, oh, we can take the edit. Um, the wow. fact that I could at least cut the cut the clips and say, well, this is how I think it should look. That was a huge time saver and also a huge value proposition for them. Um, but as a dancer, any any dancer that, that's been through what I've been through in, in being in a classical company or contemporary dance company, it kind of comes as standard that you need to be offering as much as you can um, as efficiently and economically as possible. Um, so, yeah, in, in that sense, if anyone is listening that needs someone to do everything, I'm the one man band kind of situation. <laughs> yeah. I'd love a team, though. It would be a dream to have a team, to have someone to work alongside, like you're talking about, mm -hmm. to have like I could concentrate on the movement direction and have someone I trust with the camera um, or someone that handles the edit and, and they've worked with me and know what, what I'm kind of wanting to see. That would be a, an awesome outcome. Well, that may happen because uh, uh, some of our listeners may want to take you up on that um, after – you know, uh, seeing the film, seeing your work, listening to you speak and knowing your experience uh, with all of this, um, I you'd be the one to partner up with for sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, tell me a little bit more about the, the music in your film. And by the way, just so our listeners know, we will put a link to that film Flight that you um, you were just talking about. Sure, so that'd be amazing. See, yeah, so that uh, people can see it. Um, t tell me a little bit about the music that you use, if you don't mind, uh, for these films. Sure, okay. So um, this particular film, the one I entered for your film festival, was uh, Minuet for a Cheap Piano Number no. 1, which was written by Dustin O'Halloran and Adam Wiltsey. I think I'm saying those names correctly. I apologize if not. <laughs> um, and it's performed by A Winged Victory for the Sullen. And... Um, I was actually having this conversation yesterday with uh, someone who deals with music copyright, and that's in that's my approach to uh, how I achieve music rights. That you know, I, I am punching above my weight with some of the deals that I've managed to do um, with the labels. And the first thing that the guy I was speaking to yesterday said, when you say the labels, you mean the publisher. And I don't mean the publisher, I mean the label. Um, so my advice to anyone in, in filmmaking of any kind that's looking for music, approach the artist first, if you can. And if you can't get an answer from the artist, go to the label. Because what happens is, is that you're bringing them into the process. You know, the second thing I'm advising on this is to, is to tell them as much as you can about the project that you're trying to achieve. Um, and if you're very lucky, uh, they may start to think that <laughs> either they're part of it or uh, they uh, came up with it, which is a great situation to achieve. And often it can become the case. So I have to say Erase Tape Music Publishing, who are the ones that gave me the rights for this particular piece of music. Um, they, yeah, they, they really got on board. I explained the idea. They, they suggested artists. Um, but luckily for them, I'd come with a specific artist in mind. Um, and uh, yeah, a lot of the music choices I make come out of researching a particular subject. So I don't go out and say, oh, I want something upbeat or I want something uh, from this particular artist. I, I research like, for instance, Scottish composers or um, music from a particular area of uh, Europe, you know, and that's how I kind of come to my decision on what I use. And then, yeah, as I said, the second part is um, convincing a label or an artist and then eventually the publisher that what you're doing is uh, something that, you know, is a good reflection of their artist and is something that would be worth them giving you financial support towards. Um, so all my music rights are paid for. I, I don't ever put anything out that isn't fully uh, licensed um, or under the, you know, fair use and all of that. Um, and, and, and that's been probably the most expensive part of all this filmmaking has, has been paying for music rights so far. Yeah, and there's different types of uh, licensing that you that you use for films. A lot of people um, who go on the internet looking for royalty free music or whatever uh, mm. don't realize that. But as as a as a music artist, you you want to know what your your music is going to be uh, 
how it's going to show. For example, there's a difference between using a little bit of your music or a song for a transition or in the background, um, or if it's going to drive an entire scene or, in your case, the video, right? Yeah, I mean, and also the other thing that these are the uh, label or the, the publisher responds to is your suggestion of what you would want to pay. Um, so, you know, a lot of the times I go with the figure of the last piece of music I used and I always try and improve that figure. So the figure started at X back in 2018 and I've managed to bring it down to Y as my sort of suggested figure so far. Mm. But it, again, it depends on the artist. Um, you know, there's a particular artist that I had a film for an unreleased uh, film, actually, uh, and uh, for a two minute work, they were looking at 1500 to 2000 pounds for a six month release, which is completely different. You know, that's two and a half. I don't, I think it's about two and a half thousand dollars, but that that's completely different music rights situation to the other artists I work with. And actually one of the more expensive, but again, for that artist is very cheap. It's actually a really good deal. Um, no organization would be offered a price that low for the particular artist I was trying to get the, the deal with. Um, so yeah, you, you you do need to be quite hot it, uh, on that topic, and and what am I trying to say? You need to be quite um, engaged with the current situation. There, it, it's an ever changing situation as well with social media, with the way music artists are paid. So you kind of have to you have to be up to speed on that stuff because you don't want your video taken down, and you don't want a festival to have to say we can't show your film. Mm -hmm. And I'd actually just say that one of my recent films, which was filmed on March the 12th in New York called um, Love Stained, which people will realize is a very specific time because three days later I was on a plane back to the UK <laughs> um, earlier than planned. Um, yeah, I actually managed to engage with uh, Hope Tala, who's the artist behind Love Stained uh, first, and then her label as well. And uh, yeah, as a result, I managed to get a very good deal on the release um, and where I could release and for how long. Um, so yeah, it's, a, it's an important part of the process. Well, yeah, most definitely it is. And the, and especially, I mean, we're now in a situation where theatrical uh, releases of films, right, where, like, for example, in our film festival, they would have shown live there to the audience there, let's just say that scenario, uh, but not necessarily uh, gone online, you know, maybe, right? And yep. You know, we're looking at a scenario now where a lot more films are going to go online. And that's something to consider because uh, there's more option and maybe not the artist, you know, would see it. Uh, you know, they're, obviously, if you put it on YouTube, they have their robots uh, going through everything. Uh, but in another scenario where it's not, you know, it could be someone they know. Yeah, I, I think there's the opinion on the current state of, of music licensing and then there's the reality. And unfortunately, right now, if you want to put something out um, on a, at a professional standard where you are able to you know, show it internationally and all of that, unfortunately, you have to deal with the right now. And the way things should be are not necessarily the way things are. Mm -hmm. um, but as a dancer, it's a very strange situation because when I work with if a choreographer is, is making a, a work with me involved, you know, they ask you for help. They ask you for inspiration. If you, you know, a piece wouldn't get made the way it, it ends up looking if you're not involved in that process, you know, and a choreographer doesn't copyright your movement. And, and, and again, it, it's, it's a very, it, it's a very, um, it's a very different situation when it comes to intellectual property and when it comes to, um, music rights and copyright and licensing when compared to my history in dance, uh, my, my experience in dance. So I, I personally am trying to get everything right. I'm trying to do things by the book, whether that, whether that's the best approach, I don't know. Um, but yeah, it's an ever changing situation. I'd actually give a shout out to, uh, coil, uh, which is a distributed ledger based platform, which is trying to change the way the internet is monetized. Um, and if anyone listening is interested in uh, trying a new way to monetize their film, um, Coil is in its very early stages. So, yeah, coil.com, a great thing to have a look at as a creative. How do you spell that? Uh, C-O-I-L. Okay. And uh, it's using distributed ledger technology um, built on the Ripple 
XRP cryptocurrency to make micropayments uh, to uh, artists. Um, and it's kind of a subscription based model of the Internet, essentially, which people don't realize often, um, you know, paying for the Internet sounds like an awful thing. But actually, you'd probably be saving yourself a lot of time and money because uh, you'd no longer be seeing any adverts and, uh, you know, getting the credit card every out every now and then when you see something that you want or need. Well, in in any case, we are all artists, right? And we can support each other. Film is the the one art where all the other art is combined, in 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 you know sort of a multimedia type of of um, of work or project. Uh, in your case, though, um, definitely music is very important. I mean, you don't really i mean you can uh dance to dead air of course uh silent <laughs> dancing if that's a thing but that's definitely a thing yep <laughs> but um uh, but it's good to have music if you're going to show a dancer on a film um you know the other part of this of your choreography though that i i want to talk about is the acting in in that dance uh the expression yeah, so um, working with Jamie Reed, who's a dan- he's also a dancer of the Scottish Ballet. He's a younger dancer. Um, he is uh, from Glasgow, uh, and you know um, he he really encapsulates uh, what it is to be an artist working in Glasgow because he is uh, he he's so knowledgeable in you know every different part of of the city uh, and more widely so the country of scotland and um, he's you know I, I he's not typecast but he is a scottish guy and and it was important for me that i then chose a location that kind of matched that so kelvin grove park is is this rather dramatic and, and recognizable backdrop for those that know it um, and 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 that's kind of another character that appears in the work you've kind of got jamie you've got Kelvin Grove Park, and you've actually got the bench that he's on, and the bench takes a beating, so it's also kind of another character. Um, but yeah, acting a, a, and dancing a, and, and living a character, that's something that my experience in dance and the company I've danced for, that, that's an essential thing, really. Um, and, and when I thought about my response to the music and, and, and what I was seeing, these kind of themes around isolation um around uh, perhaps loss or, de- or depression or loneliness. Um, these were things that, uh, yeah, Jamie immediately understood and identified what I was going for. And uh, he, yeah, he, he did a great job on the day, actually. I, I, he did way beyond what I was expecting because there's only so much that the camera work and the choreography can do. Um, the kind of icing on the cake, the cherry on the top, it, it is when the artist you're working with responds and engages with the idea in that way. And and, and he did in a big way. Um, and I, I actually, do, what I do, which I don't know is if it's like other filmmaking, I, I always do um, test runs, I do test shoots. Um, because I'm creating in the studio, I can set the studio up as the scene that I'm using. Um, and, and it's actually, you'd, you'd be very surprised how flexible you can be in that area. Because, you know, if you've got a three level film, for example, or you've got a long, um, a big, long uh, walkway that you've, you're planning on shooting on, you can recreate that in the studio. And it's something that as dancers, we all have to do um, anyway, because we can't always have our set in the studio with us when we're working on big ballets and things. So Jamie knew that. So um, and I understood that. So again, because we're on the same page, he understood that, that, you know, what we were doing in the studio was basically what we needed to be doing at the shoot as well. So he, he was well prepped and, and comfortable. And uh, yeah, the whole thing, actually, finding the location as well was was uh, very organic. It was kind of led by, well, you know, if this is A, how do we then move to B? If this is B, how do we get to C? And um, and I think that his acting in it was part of that process, really. It kind of just made sense for him. It was a story. Yeah, I, it is a story that a lot of people ask me some really strangely detailed questions about, like, who is he on the phone to? Or has he just come from a breakup? Uh, you know, or has he had enough of his flatmate? I, you know, that's the whole kind of point. There's an ambiguity there that you can... Um, put your own story on top of it you can decide for yourself really um, and I, even I don't really know what Jamie was uh, 
thinking for his specific, you know, uh, inspiration. But it's definitely you've seen people in that situation. Um, you see them all the time. And a lot of the time they just need someone speaking to them and talking to them. Um, and we had some runners and some cyclists going past and stopping, think, not seeing not seeing me and thinking he was going through something. So, you know, that was that meant it was kind of a, a strange sort of site specific piece at one point because it was working in that way. <laughs> Actually, now that you mention that, that's true because you're shooting with a phone, so it was very um, ambiguous, right? <laughs> yeah, and it was very early. It was like we shot between like 5 a.m. Um, and, and 7 a.m., and I'm not an early riser, and Jamie definitely is an early riser. So it was like, you know, those themes of isolation and frustration were there from the beginning. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> that anxiety was in the background at 5 a.m. for sure. Well, I, I, I love this. Well, in a way, it's like abstract art, right? So the it's up to, <laughs> I, I said this a long time ago to, to someone and they, 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 were, they almost fell on the floor laughing, but I think it's the way that I said it, not so much what I said, but it was basically the definition of art. Uh, you know, when you go to a museum or something, you see a piece of art and some people look at it and they go, ew. I, you know, they just don't like it. And other people are just mesmerized by it, you know. And in this case, what I think it's really cool that you were just talking about is the fact that there is a story there, but it's up for interpretation, right? Yeah, I mean, what what I was so pleased about, and despite that film being one of my earliest, has had one of the best responses, um, is that the thing that's clear is what he's feeling. So the actual details of what he's going through are up for debate, but it's very clear that he's frustrated. It's very clear that he's anxious and that he's isolated. It's also very clear that his phone is adding to this problem, which, you know, as a mobile filmmaker is an ironic point to be getting across. You know, yeah. I, I, the, the irony of throwing his phone in the river at the end is not lost on me. But, um, you know, um, yeah, uh, that's really and, and you said, like, you know, some people might respond with a big ew and and. Uh, that's great too. Any response is is what you kind of try, be trying to achieve there. So, spoken like a true artist, Jamie. <laughs> <laughs> um, I wondered if there's anything that um, that I am missing that you'd like to talk about. For example, um, people you'd like to mention and thank for um, the outcome of Jamie Lawrence. <laughs> well. Um, yeah, definitely. Actually, I'd like to thank Jamie himself um, because uh, he actually watched the film first of all with me live. We loved your uh, online output this year. Um, and so, yeah, obviously, thank you to Jamie for dancing the work. Um, Moondog Labs, who provide the anamorphic lens, uh, they've done a great job in supporting me. And, uh, you know, I started as a customer and now I'm an affiliate and I'm associated with them and they give me the, you know, great, uh, great rates, but also they feature my work and things like this. Um, a massive thank you to Apple, who in uh, 2019 decided to start supporting me with a bit of technology. So they've been sending me phones, which is great. That's Apple Europe. Um, yeah, thank you to Cranky and to Erase Tapes for all the support with the music rights. Um, yeah, I'm just, I'm and actually, do you know who I should thank? I should thank Zian because I, they actually awarded me a prize two days after you awarded me a prize for um, an isolation creation I'd created. And they're sending me a uh, Weeble S stabilizer, which I have no idea uh, if it will work with my phone, but I'm going to find a way. Um, but yeah, there's, there's quite a lot. But you realize when you go through this process of wanting to do something new and trying to achieve in that area, um, you, you start to pick up, you know, deep support from people um, early on. And you only realize how deep that support is when you get to about now. Two years later, these people are th the people you're relying on, really. So, yeah, without all this technology assistance and continuing sort of encouragement from these companies, um, you know, it would be a lot harder to do. Actually, share a little bit about your isolation, mobile isolation creations. Yeah. So um, as I said earlier, I just produced Love Stained. Um, I got back to the UK earlier than planned. We were touring with Scottish Ballet um, at the Joyce Theatre in New York. Um, all the shows are cancelled. So we flew back one day before they then said they were cancelling all travel. And I spent the next three weeks um, 
well, I spent the first first few weeks being ill, actually. Um, oh no! I was, yeah, no, I was I was pretty unwell, but we won't talk about that because it's fine now. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I, I I didn't really know what I wanted to say. I was finding my lack of you know freedom, although it's kind of a selfish thing to say in the light of all the safety things. I was finding my lack of freedom very frustrating. Um, the media was creating a lot of fear, um, you know, which they can do when they feel like it, I guess. You know, I'd, so I, I couldn't really decide what I wanted to say. I was seeing dancers output things. Every dancer I know was teaching. Every dancer I know had a go at creating, which is super positive. But at the time was frustrating because why didn't I have anything I could do or say? And I was listening to Daft Punk randomly on a shuffle on my phone. That's and I was like, one of my favorite bands. Well, they were then telling me what to do. They were saying, push it, shove it, turn it, twist it, lock it. <laughs> and I was like, do you know what? If I can't find a way in, let them lead me. So, yeah, by producing a, a 30 second clip there, that became the first in my series of isolation creations. And um, then my second creation, which is again done in my living room, although a lot of people don't seem to understand that um, because my wide angle lens makes it look massive. But I can assure you it's only four or five meters wide and. <laughs> um, yeah, my second creation ended up being a bit more substantial. Um, and that was with my partner, Constance Devonay, who's a principal of Scottish Ballet and uh, who lives with me, obviously, as my partner. And uh, yeah, we uh, ended up producing a nearly two minute work there that I think I'm going to enter for quite a few things now. Um, so, yeah, on two by two meters of, of dance floor. And um, so, yeah, I decided to, I just, you know, I, I need to be doing something at the moment. I need to be outputting. And by deciding to not only do that, but also edit for a lot of my friends who are in isolation and um, a lot of choreographer friends of mine who've kind of in this situation turned around and gone, you know how to do something about this video stuff. Can you help? You know, <laughs> um, it's, yeah, working with them. I actually cut something yesterday for a friend of mine and um, Constant Vigier, who I'll name drop here. Um, you'll see a link in my Instagram story. Um, I cut something for him that I helped him create. And we talked about how could he use his phone to, you know, make it look like he's not stuck in his living room also. Um, so, yeah, m me and many other choreographers at this time are pushing out in all directions. And I just decided to formalize mine by calling it a series, which will hopefully mean that I'll keep outputting, you know, um, as yeah, we don't seem to be coming out of this situation in Scotland anytime soon. I've got about at least another month. So, yeah, watch that space for the next one, basically. So maybe maybe this will be uh, like a web series, huh? Well, having won the the um, the Z and stabilizer from the first one and having attracted attention with the second, my one of the executives at Scottish Ballet actually emailed me and said that this lockdown seems to suit me. Maybe they should lock me up more often. <laughs> um, but, yeah, people respond differently and a lot of people have been adapting and uh, kind of narrating their lockdown in that way whereas the thing for me to do is to try and do what I always have done and not let that you know it's just another creative restriction a challenge that you've got to face and so I'm hoping that my work doesn't look too much like it was filmed in lockdown um which is you know we'll see how people respond to it I guess yeah no definitely well um I want to ask you something I almost forgot I want to play a game with you Let's go for it. <laughs> All right. Um, and actually, now I'm curious. So I'm going to put you on the spot here. And now I've got a timer. Um, right. So don't worry about timing this. But I'm going to give you 20 seconds. Why did my phone want to do 28 minutes? I don't know. Hold on a second here. Um, <laughs> that would have taken a while. Uh, you would have been here till tomorrow. Um yeah. I'm a bit nervous. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's a history question. Right? <laughs> um, but what I want in 20 seconds is your favorite um, bands of music. So we've been talking about music anyway. So, um, And you just mentioned Daft Punk, so you can leave that one out. <laughs> okay. So are you ready? Get yep, I'm ready. Get set and... Go. Okay, so we're definitely going to have to have Aerosmith in there. Um, he's on every drive to work. Um, I absolutely love Gabriel Fauré, who's obviously a composer, not a band, but we'll keep him in there. Uh, the Beatles, massive influence. Uh, Charlie Parker on the sax. Uh, I play the sax, so that's something that influences me. Oh, no, is that it? That's, that's 20 it. seconds. That's it. it goes fast. 
doesn't it? It does go really fast. And uh, I seem to just add all this extra information to all the things that I say anyway. (laughs) I should have. um, So for anyone who is listening, whoever plans to be in the podcast and get put on the spot, list them all and then we can talk about them later. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Um, Tell me. Oh, it's still. Hold on. Go away. Okay. Um, Sorry about that. Um, (laughs) The alarm of the apocalypse. Um, I have that alarm, that particular alarm, because it reminds me of Return of the Living Dead. Yeah, and it is the apocalypse. So, uh, you know. (laughs) It kind of is, isn't it? Mm. Uh, God, we are living, we are living, get your opinion on this. I mean, we're living in a time, right? Uh, in many ways, we are very lucky because we get to experience this firsthand as opposed to, you know, sitting in a theater watching it, right? Um, and in, but in another, in another way, I mean, it's, it's just crazy. I think, what do you think they're going to say in about, okay, we'll all be dead and gone, but in a hundred years from now, right? When they look back through time, do you think they'll pick this particular time in our history out of all our history and look at this and say wow look what these people had to go through and how much the world has changed or do you think um this really won't be as big a deal as it seems to us right now yeah i mean so uh, a few times in my life i've had this thing thrown at me called the jahari window which is to do with um for those that don't know it's uh how you see yourself how others see you how you want other people to see you and the unknown, which is, you know, um, that which you can't know. And I think this kind of applies to this situation. You know, everything is unknown and to worry about it and to, to allow fear to kind of generate as a result is, 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 it's not a good thing to be doing. So my advice to anyone and the way I feel about this situation right now is to keep doing what you're doing and, and, you know, keep being true to what it is that you want to be putting out there creatively, whether that's just what you do every day, you know, obviously there's disruption. You can't go outside. You can't um, travel in the same way that you would usually. Um, But, you know, you've got to face those challenges down and you've got to kind of just keep pushing through in that way. Um, And there's something that I think Mark Twain said, which is uh, those who would trade their freedom uh, for their safety uh, deserve neither. And I think that that kind of applies to this, you know, keep, you, you know, obviously there's safety, be safe, uh, do the social distancing as required for this thing, but don't trade your freedom and, and, and put yourself in your own prison of worry and fear because that's a negative place to be um, as a person, really, but also as a choreographer. I wouldn't be able to make anything I make. It's true, and we don't want to limit ourselves to the point to where, um, I mean, I mean, I was just thinking about last year. You know, last year, life was so completely different. I mean, for a film festival, just to just one event, you know, uh, we were hugging. We were doing selfies. I don't even know if we'll be able to do selfies anytime soon. But, you It'd know. It'd be very difficult to dance and partner someone without being able to touch them, which I don't think is ever going to be a reality for dance. You know, it'd be like taking the guitar away from the guitarist or the piano away from the pianist. It's, it's not, it wouldn't be possible to dance in that sense. And it's our job as uh, choreographers and dancers to kind of tread that line between uh, how do we get back to where we were and uh, how do we stay true to what dance is in that sense. So yeah, I'll be interested to see who goes in what direction after that, because I think there's a sense that everyone's going to scatter and and approach this uh, situation very differently to how they did before. Yeah, and I and I see creatively, I see an opportunity here to make the world a better place, but to not lose what what we've had that we we really should cherish, which is the humanity of all of us to connect, and that does include our distance from one another. We need to be able to do that. Yeah, and don't be afraid to ask ask these questions. You know, there's a lot of um, social distancing going on in conversations, which is a very strange thing for me um, as someone that often says what they think. Um, Yeah, there's a lot of uh, don't say anything against this narrative or don't um, question it or anything. And the only way that we can make things better is to be, you know, objectively questioning and, 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 and considering our opinions in that way. So 
we've, yeah. we've gone on a ta- COVID tangent here, but COVID, uh, COVID tangent. But yeah, it's uh, <laughs> it's a strange situation, and uh, I'm trying to just create as I always have. Yeah, we'll continue to keep creating. In the meantime, time will pass, and this too shall pass. To quote somebody out there who said that. Um, <laughs> Yeah, and and I hope to be in San Diego in person next time. Um, I'm very much looking forward to visiting, hopefully, a future festival. So. Yeah, no, most definitely, it'll be great. Uh, we, no matter what, we have to. I, I mean, at least get these the filmmakers from this year's. How how was just just really quick? Don't don't dwell on this too much. But um, I know you said you watched uh, the film festival and everything um, uh, with with. Was it with Jamie? Yeah, so we watched well, Jamie at his house and me at my place. We stayed in contact via FaceTime and, and watched it together. Nice. Um, and we really enjoyed it. And it's the first one that we've been at together or that I've actually been at at all because I actually was in the New York Mobile Film Festival as a selection and my flight got cancelled the day before. I was, I was literally doing an overnight stopover so I could be at this festival. I was very excited. It was the first international trip as a result of my own work. Um, and uh, the French decided to do an air traffic control strike, which cancelled my <laughs> flight. So I'd never actually been to any of the festivals, even though that I'd ach- even uh, ones that I'd achieved awards at or, or, or finalist places. So y- you're actually my very first film festival experience where mm-hmm. I've put something in myself. So, um, yeah, you can consider me your your first ever online mobile uh, film festival goer as an as a creative artist that's been in several film festivals. And this was our first virtual film yeah. festival, too. So for, <laughs> for me, it worked great because if I wasn't able to come to San Diego, um, yeah. which I'd, I'd been told I'd kind of been given the heads up from Scottish Ballet that I could, even though we were performing Swan Lake at the time. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, it, it, it even if I hadn't been able to, having it online actually really helps. And I do hope that even when it's live, that, you know, a stream of the event would be super. Cool. Well, that's good to know. You never know. Yeah, Um, absolutely. um, Well, listen, it's been a pleasure talking to you. um, And uh, I would ask you at this point, I, I hope, I think, to be honest, our discussion was wonderful. And I hope our listeners got a lot of, um, nutrition <laughs> for the soul <laughs> and the art and uh, the dream and uh, inspiration from it. So now I would say for you to say goodbye to our listeners. Yep. Goodbye, everyone. Well, not goodbye, because I hope to see you all soon. And um, please do follow me on all my social medias. Uh, it's under my name, Jimmy or Lawrence, uh, everywhere you can find me. Wonderful. And uh, yeah, thank you for having me. You're very welcome. 